In this video I will break down the gameplay structures of Limbo and Inside in order to talk about how both games are not trying to hide their artificiality, but how they are instead actively using their constructed nature as video games to ask very specific questions. These games took more than 10 years to develop, but can be played through on a single lazy Sunday, which I heavily encourage you to do before watching this, since I will be spoiling everything. Where most games justify their gameplay with a story that tells you why going to the right is important and will solve big problems, Limbo and Insight give you ambiguous, almost non-stories, and assume that you will be interested in going to the right because there's nothing interesting happening on the left. Both games also end as ambiguous and as confusing as they started. There are vague vistas and little bits of environmental storytelling that can be interpreted in many different ways, but attempts at deciphering concrete narratives tend to read like fan fiction, and to me it also seems unnecessary to do that, because no matter how vague both games are with their direct stories, they are instead extremely deliberate with the structure of their gameplay. Limbo starts incredibly grounded. The first puzzles of the game negotiate its own physicality, showing you what the boy can do and what will kill him, as you are slowly introduced to mechanics before you have to use them while under pressure. First you learn that bear traps are dangerous, then you learn that you can trigger them without dying yourself, and only then does the game ask you to use them against the spider. This process of learning a new thing and then being tested on it while under pressure is at the core of Limbo, and immediately after hurting the spider you will be introduced to the next concept that you will have to use to save your life later on. When you roll a boulder into a tree, you might not expect that tree to fall on your head and kill you, but after essentially the same puzzle is presented to you again and again, you instantly recognize what you have to do when you see a similar trap while the spider is chasing you. It is in these moments when Limbo is at its best. When you are in mortal danger, but then use your knowledge of the game's internal logic to survive, when you do not need to be taught anything anymore, when you can act intentionally. Like when the spider tries to stab you one last time, and you recognize the movement from an earlier sequence and instinctively dodge, or when you outsmart an obvious trap without having to jump into it first. And while Limbo is never really explicit about why exactly you are doing all these things, in the beginning it tries to connect its obstacles to its fiction. Traps are laid by humans, probably to keep the giant spider away, which only goes on a rampage after you hurt it by tricking it with the bear traps. Here, Limbo uses not only environmental, but also a kind of mechanical storytelling, presenting you a world that follows the same rules that you are bound to, but that exists independent of you, the player. The humans are responsible for all of the traps and they protect their village with a fake spider arm, directly mimicking a gameplay section from earlier, but if you nevertheless enter that village, they keep you from breaking into their homes by pulling up ropes that you could have climbed on otherwise. This first part of Limbo also has a satisfyingly coherent conclusion to its gameplay. The humans are crushed by traps themselves, and the spider, which chased you across a field of spikes before, gets pushed into spikes and turned into a platform. But after the spider and the humans have been killed, Limbo changes. The core loop remains the same, as the game presents you with new mechanics and safe environments before asking you to act on your in-game knowledge while under pressure, but the mechanics themselves become more and more artificial the longer the game goes on, relying on indifferent machines instead of organic antagonists. The dangerous chase sequences get replaced with rising water, where instead of running to the right you now have to move upwards, relying on floating objects to survive, and the brain worms, the rotating world and the switching gravity all fulfill the same mechanical function, taking control away from you, forcing you to move in specific ways to avoid death, while at the same time testing your knowledge of Limbo's other mechanics. In between these tense situations, you solve puzzles that deal with increasingly abstract concepts and have to rely on more and more convoluted setups the longer the game goes on. 
the idea of momentum as a game mechanic is thoroughly explored before the world starts to rotate and you have to avoid deadly boulders, but it is presented without narrative context. It is not grounded in Limbo's world. Because that world is now abandoned and empty, and the set pieces of Limbo cannot connect to it anymore, and are instead referencing previous situations, are using mechanics in interesting ways, or are just showing you something that looks pretty cool. Nevertheless, there are moments that really worked for me, that made me remember those magical situations in the beginning, where I would just act according to a situation and survive. Like, when you are standing on a box that is not as buoyant as you hoped, and are trying not to panic while waiting for the right time to jump to safety, or when the world starts to rotate and you are given just enough time to realize that a door is going to fall on your head if you do not move away quickly. But moments like these become increasingly rare as the game relies more and more on levers, buttons and huge mechanisms to facilitate its gameplay. Where Limbo's physics engine can create a sense of immediacy that is very hard to achieve with code, its later mechanics could be encountered in any other puzzle platformer as the game loses interest in its own physicality. It even stops trying to justify its gameplay with machinery as you platform your way through a brief section where assets from earlier places appear for a second time before you enter a completely abstract environment where the game ends in total surreality. What Limbo is trying to say in terms of concrete narrative remains unclear, and as a gameplay experience it is almost disappointing, but if you look at Limbo as a series of puzzles, if you look at the structure of its gameplay, then it expresses something very concrete. Where most games just present you an implausible world and ask you to suspend your disbelief for the whole runtime, Limbo tries its hardest to present you with a grounded, internally coherent place in the beginning, only to then end in a space that is not only completely abstract, but that is also no longer trying to hide its artificiality. Limbo's puzzles become increasingly detached and video gamey because the game tries to make you experience what it feels like to move through the realm of death as you slowly lose touch with reality. But in order to do so, it has to abandon its strongest gameplay aspects, its physicality and its internal logic. Still, Limbo is so fascinating to me because it does not tell a story at you, but makes you experience one for yourself as the game tears its own reality down bit by bit until there is nothing left to hold onto and you have completely moved over into the indescribable afterlife. Where Limbo is a linear journey into the unknowable realm of death, inside is a cyclical rumination on control. Even the game's environments direct you, control you, as objects appear to be solid, enticing you to jump in the direction the developers wanted you to go, yellow marks on the floor show where cards have to be placed for puzzles to be solvable, and things you need to interact with are suspiciously often colored in red. Inside is a lot less deadly and a lot shorter than Limbo, not relying on introducing new mechanics as much and instead iterating over a few types of gameplay for its whole runtime. It is also a lot more laid back than Limbo, a lot more humorous. Sometimes it directly judges you, the player, like when you look at a line of zombies and don't pay attention to where you're going, only to then fall to your death, waiting to respawn as the zombies mock you in the background, marching to the right just as mindlessly as you. The game also goes out of its way to bait you, to trick you into treating its world as artificial, as constructed. You see a cart and a rope, and if you do not stop to consider that they are actually connected to each other, then you pull the cart backwards only for the game to laugh at you as the rope disappears into the sky. You see huge robots in the background, and you also see a red lever, and if you act on video game instincts, then you will activate the robots before even checking to see what they are guarding. When you encounter a red box, you correctly assume that you need to push it somewhere, but once again, if you just drop down and push the box onto the conveniently placed pressure plate, you will have made it impossible for yourself to get back to the mind control helmet and need to manually reset the puzzle to be able to solve it. These puzzles are probably my favorite part of Inside. 
They are carefully crafted to mislead you, incorporating a fail state into the process of solving the puzzle, and they feel like they are a sort of inside joke that you can partake in, even if it is one at your expense. Not only does the game mock you, it also breaks your trust in its solidity, literally pulling the rug out from under you, making you think that you are dead for sure, only to then reveal that this was necessary to progress all along. First you walk over a few wooden boards that hold your weight, but the next one breaks beneath your feet. After the game allows you to take revenge on wooden boards in general by actively ripping them out of a wall, it will present you with the longest, most fragile looking board yet. But this one holds your weight, and just as you are ready to trust the game again, the floor beneath you breaks. In the most extreme instance of this, the game actually kills you, only to then have a mermaid revive you, giving you underwater breathing and complete mind control powers, after you watch the boy slowly sink to the ground for ages, making it very clear that you are not actually in control of this experience. On the other hand, you directly control zombies in the game's more overt puzzles, moving them around like puppets. Over the course of the game, you gain more and more mobility while controlling them, until in the end they are almost player characters, huddling around the boy and expanding his movement set. In the game's numerous chase puzzles, you are not only controlling the boy, but also, indirectly, whatever is chasing him. Instead of just running away, you have to, once more, take a step back and act within inside's rules. You have to trick your enemies, you have to bait them to move to an unfavorable position before you can make a run for it. Sometimes you have to directly play out a scene that Inside has prepared for you or you will die, but the game always makes sure to technically introduce its internal rules before asking you to act on them, showing you that light is dangerous, that you need to avoid it, so that when you have to choose between swimming into the light and diving, you intuitively know what to do. All of these types of gameplay point in the same direction and are asking similar questions. Are you just a puppet, acting out pre-written scenes? Even if you fail to solve a puzzle, you do it in a way that the developers seem to have anticipated. Are they controlling you in the same way that the boy controls the zombies? Who is really in control here? Where a limbo is a linear experience that only reveals its intentions in the end, Inside has integrated its theme into its core loop, into its very gameplay. It is constantly asking the same questions from different perspectives and is constantly highlighting its own artificiality while you, the player, get more and more control the longer the game goes on. The first few chapters of Inside contain some of the game's most memorable moments as you are chased through a forest as the environmental storytelling literally wakes up to introduce you to the chase puzzles and as you have to act like a zombie after the game made fun of you for behaving like one. But after the city sequence, the game doesn't introduce anything fundamentally new, iterating over its core types of gameplay instead, allowing you, the player, to recognize patterns and to act intentionally, while also slowly preparing you for its ending. The submarine gives you a brief taste of the underwater breathing power you will acquire later, familiarizing you with the idea of staying submerged for long periods of time, while also giving you power over a light source. Until now, every time you were in the light, you were in immediate danger, but now it is you who is shining light on the mermaids, who, just like you, have learned to avoid it. This power trip cannot last, of course, and you have to abandon the submarine in the sand as you move on into the mines where you will get another taste of your future powers, wearing a mind control helmet while being able to move, collecting more and more zombies. The Zonic Boom not only takes your mind control helmet, but also your freedom of movement away from you. Here, Inside forces you to immerse yourself in the rhythm of the level, turning conventional platforming into a kind of puzzle. Just like Limbo, the longer Inside goes on, the more it changes, as it loses its snark, and as the hoverboxes and water level puzzles feel decidedly artificial, but the chase puzzles and zombies make sure that the world never becomes completely empty, while the development of the new mechanics is spaced out over a long period of time, 
obscuring their artificiality. Towards the end of Inside, you spend a lot of time escaping from the mermaid, tricking it over and over again, making you confident in your ability to outsmart the game, but then Inside betrays you, breaking your trust once more, killing the boy only to then revive him and giving you underwater breathing and mind control powers in the process. Inside has introduced you to these concepts with the help of machines before, so even if this upgrade hardly makes sense from a narrative perspective, in terms of gameplay it feels weirdly familiar and coherent. The surreal and abstract sequences that are now possible are taking place in a mysterious high-tech facility and the game quickly stops swallowing in its more removed puzzles to focus on building up tension for its final sequence instead. On your way into the tank, Inside's theme is summed up in a mechanically beautiful way. To control a crane, you simply press a button, which immediately takes your control over the boy away and transfers it directly onto the crane, just as you are sitting motionless in front of your device, pressing buttons to move the boy. By now, you are very familiar with all of the rules of Inside's world, you're perfectly prepared for the huddle sequence where Inside's physicality brutally reasserts itself, while the game also subverts all of its types of gameplay. The huddle takes time to build up speed, you are encouraged to just rampage through the offices, killing people left and right, but if you slow down, if you act intentionally, you can save a lot of lives, just as paying attention to Inside's rules can save you and the boy a lot of deaths in the beginning. A short time later, your ability to save lives by giving people time to run away turns from a neat little thing you can discover into something that the game requires you to do. So once again, Inside has given you hints before you have to perform, as instead of having to bait enemies to survive, you are now the enemy and you have to move yourself into a position where you are harmless so that a worker can open a door for you. The puzzles in the huddle sequence seem artificial, designed by the people of Inside's world specifically for you to solve them. There are places where they fucked up, where they have to lend you a helping hand, calling attention to the constructed nature of the whole experience. The beams of light are brought back as well. They used to be attached to humans, robots and your submarine, but then became a detached mechanic, a simple kill zone over the course of the game, until they are now used as a theater spotlight, shining on an obvious trap. You are, of course, expecting the game to break the floor beneath you, but every time this has happened so far, it was necessary to progress. And so you step onto the stage and you act your part. Through its whole runtime, Insight constantly switches between making you feel like you are in control and then showing you that, actually, you have been guided by the developer's helping hand all along. It is this tension between its constructed nature as a video game and how it nevertheless wants you to believe in its internal logic that is at the core of Inside. The game wants you to treat what is happening on screen as real. It wants you to immerse yourself in a world that is fake and artificial, that was deliberately constructed by a bunch of people. In the end, this just gets pointed out diegetically. The theme of control is brought to its most logical conclusion when you find all the hidden collectibles, solve a music puzzle and then unplug the game from within, revealing the boy to be a zombie and the player to be the zombie in the background or something along these lines. Limbo features a similar system where after crushing all the hidden insect eggs, an ominous door opens into a dangerous dark level that brings you directly to Limbo's surreal conclusion. Both of these hidden endings put a clear and concrete emphasis on how the games try to communicate with you, without adding anything substantial to what they are already expressing. In Limbo, with its focus on a linear journey into the afterlife, you get to skip some of the more coherent parts of the game, and in Inside you get a final rumination on its theme, a final twist on top of the convoluted mess of who is actually controlling who. While superficially extremely similar, Limbo and Inside use their shared design space in wildly different ways. Limbo constantly takes control away from you, spinning you into a cocoon, restricting your movement with the brain worms, forcing you to wait for water to rise, for the world to rotate and for gravity to switch, while at the same time gradually stripping away its believability 
ending in a surreal, removed space. Insight, on the other hand, gives you more and more control as you go on, first with machines and then by injecting their functionalities directly into the player character, culminating in the huddle sequence where Insight's types of gameplay are inverted and the constant references to its artificiality become explicit, where they are expressed through the internal rules of its own world. Both games are impossible to decipher in terms of plot, as they only vaguely gesture in the direction of coherent narratives, because at their core, Limbo and Inside are not trying to tell conventional stories, they are trying to make you experience complex issues that have no satisfying answers. What happens after we die? And are we really in control of our own lives? And while dismissing these questions as pretentious is easy, what I find so fascinating is that Limbo and Inside are not directly asking them, but that they make you play through them, that they can raise these questions exclusively through their gameplay. Where most games feel the need to explain themselves to you, to give you an excuse for moving to the right, Limbo and Inside are instead trying to completely immerse you in the act of playing. But no matter how immediate and magically real they manage to feel when you are acting within their internal logic, Limbo and Inside nevertheless embrace their nature as constructed video games instead of trying to shamefully hide it. In fact, they both actively use that artificiality to present questions without answers, asking you to solve them as if they were just another puzzle. Thanks for watching. Hello and welcome to the postscriptum part of the video. I want to thank Felix and George and especially Finn for helping me with rewriting the script for this again and again and again and again because this was extremely hard to write, especially compared to the Disco Elysium video um, because my f the, like the first conclusion I came to was wrong and then the next conclusion I came to was just kind of boring and there was a whole like it, it was very hard to find a kind of reason to make this video other than oh my god I love these games and I want to talk about them um, so that made it very very hard to find the correct angle and like a framing for this whole thing which is pretty stupid because if I if I just if I like something I should just talk about it without uh, trying to like make a, some 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 big theory or some some grand statement or something um, but I don't I, I also want to be very careful with this and that I don't waste anyone's time like I, I want to make stuff that actually says something interesting I don't want to just talk about games because I like them so there's this kind of like tension <laughs> inside of me where I'm like I really want to talk about this but I also don't want to just just talk about it um, but I'm gonna try I think to not be so tense about that with the next one I'm just gonna try to like have a little bit of fun um, and maybe be a little bit more freeform because another like a, a feedback I got from the disco video was that the post scriptum part was like much more alive and kind of enjoyable than the rest of the video which makes sense because I, I have this like um, idea that I want to make something that's maybe not extremely entertaining and more informative and I feel that if I if I just uh, talk like I talk now then I'm, I'm, I'm gonna veer off into the direction of just like oh yeah this is entertainment and here's my good buddy Josh who is making YouTube videos and I can listen to him and I can get to know him and he's this real person and I, I don't I, I, I fucking hate parasocial Reddit, Reddit b -b 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 I fucking hate parasocial relationships. I don't want this YouTube channel to create something like that, which is also why I'm not replying to any of your comments, um, which is like, thanks for commenting and, and, and stuff like that. I, I, I'm just not going to go into the YouTube comments um, so that I can keep enjoying this and don't get like too connected to it. I think like if I, if I, if I, take this too seriously if I, I try to make good content too hard then it's gonna stop being fun for me 
But yeah, I'm gonna try to be like a little bit more conversational for the next video, um, just to see if, if I enjoy that, if that's if that's something I can um, find pleasure in. Uh, that next video is gonna be about Mirror's Edge, um, which I also wrote the whole script for, which also had no thesis, so it's uh, perfect to test out the more freeform style. Um, but yeah, thanks thanks a lot for watching. Like this is a lot to fun. Uh, this is a lot of fun to make. And I hope it's also a lot of fun to watch. But oh yeah, there's one thing. Um, two of the people who have been with Playdad since the beginning, since Limbo, um, have split off from the company and now they're making their own games, both of which look kind of similar to Limbo and Inside. So like in the future, we, we're gonna have free games because Playdad is making another one as well. We're gonna have free games that are kind of going in a similar direction, but they're all probably gonna focus on different things and it's just, it's, it's going to be so fascinating uh, to compare those three. So I'm really looking forward to that. Um, and there's also, like, this this whole, like, type of game is, 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 it comes from a cinematic platforming genre. And there's a new one releasing, which is called Lunark, um, which is, like, made by an independent person whose name I just forgot. But it also looks really cool. And, like, yeah, if, if, if you like Limbo and Inside in general, you should check out the cinematic platformers, like stuff like the Eternal Castle, or Apes Odyssey, or Another World, especially Another World, um, because it's like a, it's like it's like a weird subgenre that has, that has existed for a long time, and there are a lot of like if, if yeah if you like Limbo and Inside, check out cinematic platformers because there's a big chance that they're gonna blow your mind like they did mine. Um, but yeah, that's it. Okay. Postscript in part, stop. Um, you have a nice, have a nice day. Bye bye.